Ladies and gentlemen, our next panel is titled The Role of Multilateralism in Dealing with Global Crises, where the panel will discuss the current challenges facing the G20 as well as multilateralism, in addition to potential solutions towards ensuring that multilateral institutions can play a robust role in, in the global economic recovery. Please allow me to welcome the chair of this session, Dr. Fahad al turki the Vice President of Research at CAPSARC and the Chair of T20 Saudi Arabia. Uh, thank you, Saleh, uh, Your Royal Highness, Your Excellency. Uh, it's a pleasure to reconnect with you today as well uh, on our third day uh, for um, our T20 Mid-Year Web Conference. Um, I'm happy to moderate um, a panel today on an important topic the role of multilateralism in dealing with a uh, global crisis. Um, but before I do that, I would like to extend a thank to His Royal Highness Prince uh, Turkey Faisal for his encouraging remark and the support that we have received from um, KF Press, King Faisal Center for Research and Islamic Studies. Uh, it's been a tremendous journey with the center. I will echo the same thanks to the president of CAPSAR the other co-leading institution for their uh, tremendous support on uh, T20 efforts. Um, also, uh, thanks to um, His Excellency Fahad, Fahad al-Mubarak for the support that we get from the T20. We heard all the policy recommendations uh, and the debate that was um, occurring or happening yesterday uh, with the breakout sessions. This would not have happened without the support of the T20 and the engagement that we have with the policymakers. Having the dialogue with the policymakers is important to enhance the policy recommendations that we are drafting. And that is happening with the Saudi G20, not only with the T20, but also with other engagement groups. Uh, His Excellency Fahad Mubarak mentioned the financial crisis back in 2008 and 2009 as an important milestone for the G20 uh, creation and formation. Uh, and during that time, uh, many of us remember that the economic meltdown uh, would have been far worse if not for the extraordinary uh, policy and pragmatic approach adopted by many governments and international organizations. These measures were coupled with the assistance provided by various development organizations international financial institutions, and other multilateral uh, development banks. Many of them are joining us today um, as in this panel. But in the context of this crisis, of this pandemic that we are living through, which is probably the most significant civilizational threat that we have seen in our lifetime, it has already taken an enormous toll on, uh, on the society, on our healthcare system, um, and also markets and the economies. There are some voices um, uh, that are um, being heard uh, that the role of the multilateralism and the international institutions are falling short relative to the magnitude of, the, uh, of this pandemic. As we see, many countries have tried to uh, mitigate the devastating impact of this pandemic. Many countries have taken unprecedented executive measures, including closing borders, with what we know significant impact on trade, supply chain, and also flows of trade, uh, finance and investment across countries. The IMF have predicted that we will see a contractionary of 3% globally this year. And just yesterday, the IMF chief economist uh, mentioned that probably we will see uh, even deeper contraction this year than earlier anticipated. So the fight against this global pandemic is, is definitely a, a stark reminder that the world needs more not less multilateral cooperation and global solidarity. Multilateralism is about cooperation in the pursuit of a common goal and the action, not just of government, but also people and organization are an essential part 
of the multilateral landscape, especially now when some governments have introduced measures that are, may, in the long term, have increased suffering, not only uh, health-wise, but also economically and socially. So probably this crisis may play a constructive role in rebuilding, rethinking the multilateralism role after uh, country after countries will realize uh, the short-term and long-term danger of looking inward. So this crisis could be an opportunity to reform and rethink existing international organizations to better build, deal with the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a distinguished panel today uh, to shed some light on the role of the multilateral um, institutions um, in dealing with the pandemics. In a fundamental sense, uh, they don't need uh, an introduction. So I will be very uh, brief and apologize if I mispronounce any of, of the name, of the names of our esteemed uh, panelists. We have, we're delighted to have Jailo Bazarba Shonu, the Vice President of Equitable Growth, Finance and Institutions at the World Bank. We have Martin Molizan, Director of the Strategy, Policy and Review Department at the International Monetary Fund. And Alan Wolf, the Director General or the Deputy Director General of the World Trade Organization. Adam Bolokas, Resident Representative of the UNDP. And last but not least, Luis Di Molo, Director of the Economic Department at OECD. So I don't think we could have a better qualified panel to address the, global, the multilateralism role in facing the pandemic. I won't take any more time. I will ask them for a brief eight minute introductory thoughts. Um, and before we get, I give the mic to, uh, to our first panelist, I would just say that for our attendees, um, if you have a question, we will probably save uh, 20 to 15 minutes at the end of the panel. For, an, for a Q&A session. If you have a question, you can raise your hand uh, and we will uh, the mic, give the mic to you to ask a question. Or we will kindly ask you to be uh, brief, introduce yourself and uh, identify who you are asking the question to. Uh, I will first invite uh, Jaila to give us uh, her thoughts from the World Bank. And then we will follow the order that has stated in the, in the agenda. Jaila, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you. Um, I had uh, sent some slides. I don't know if it's possible to put them up. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as I said, I have been listening to some of the discussions, deliberations of the task force and uh, impressive amount of very good work uh, has been done. And what I would like to do today is uh, talk about our recent um, Global Economic Prospects report, where we have been discussing the implications of um, COVID-19, especially on emerging markets and developing economies, and then talk about some of the policy issues that we have been grappling with. The key message I have, and I heard this from uh, many of the participants earlier, uh, task force members earlier today, is that uh, this is an unprecedented uh, shock and urgent and coordinated uh, response from the global community is uh, very much needed. We, um, as I mentioned, we published our Global Economic Prospects Report on June 8th, and uh, accordingly, the global economy will shrink by 5.2% this year. This would represent the deepest recession since the Second World War. So this is what we are grappling with. It's uh, the largest fraction of economies since 1870, and more than 90% of economies are expected to experience declines in per capita output in 2020. Emerging market economies and developing uh, countries are expected to shrink by 2.5% this year. And this is uh, very substantial because it's the first time as a group that uh, in last at least 60 years that this um, group is, uh, is seeing a contraction in output. What that means is that per capita incomes decline 
by 3.6%. And that, of course, has uh, huge implications in terms of poverty and the ability to reach the sustainable development goals. The crisis has impacted um, capital flows. It has impacted remittances, which is an economic lifeline for many low-income families uh, and uh, refugees, and a key source of revenue for many developing countries. So remittances are, are expected to fall by at least one-fifth in 2020. So this is, um, uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, this is, uh, of course, subject to significant downside risks. In our, this, I just presented you a really sober outlook, but that's our baseline scenario. And uh, we are worried about the rapid spread of uh, COVID-19 in, in emerging market countries. The rising number of infections in EMDs present uh, a third global wave of the COVID-19 outbreaks. And with limited health facilities, we are very concerned about the implications for lives, but also livelihoods. And as I mentioned, the pandemic is hitting the poor and the vulnerable the hardest. Government restrictions to stem the spread of the pandemic affect the services sector particularly, and the large majority of firms and workers in this sector are informal, and there are many women who work in this sector. So the crisis is really impacting the lives of the, um, the older population and the livelihoods of the younger and especially the, the women. The large majority of these, as I mentioned, these um, workers are in the informal sector and they don't have the capacity to be able to smooth their consumption because they don't have access to uh, health services or a social safety net. And they live in uh, crowded uh, working and living conditions, which makes it even much more difficult to deal uh, with the impact of this pandemic. So we forecast that um, the global recession could push uh, 70 to 100 million people into extreme poverty, and which will create, um, which will cause the global poverty rate to rise, rate to rise for the first time since 1998. An estimated 18 million people, uh, additional 18 million people in countries affected by fragility, conflict, and violence could fall into extreme poverty at a time when the pandemic is further exacerbating instability. Millions of people in East Africa are facing a triple crisis, unfortunately, the health emergency, the global recession, as well as the local swarms that are threatening food security and livelihoods. And about 90% of world's children have seen their schooling disrupted. And we know from the Ebola crisis that this increases dropout rates and can cause lasting income losses. And this is the key point that uh, I would like to leave with you, that this is not a, a, a recession that has implications only for the, you know, this year and next, but it does mean lasting scars in terms of um, uh, impacting human capital, impacting uh, livelihoods going forward. There has been, um, uh, and if you could go to the uh, next slide, please, there has been many uh, policies uh, that have been taken by central banks, um, and this has limited the impact, uh, if, at least in terms of disruptions in the financial sector. There has been massive liquidity support and monetary policy accommodation, but still um, what that means is um, this creates uh, an uneven playing field with many countries unable to provide the needed uh, policy space um, uh, to react to the crisis both in terms of the health and economic implications. What we have seen in many countries is um, uh, especially advanced economies, unprecedented policies. The U.S. has put in place measures that are four times larger than those implemented during the global financial crisis that started in 2008. Euro area has put in measures that are five times as large, and that's not even counting the loan guarantees. Even many of the emerging market economies have announced fiscal stimulus of 5.4% of GDP. And if you add this all up, it's close to $10 trillion of stimulus, mainly concentrated in advanced economies. But what that also means is given that many of the emerging markets and developing economies started this crisis at a really vulnerable state with rec record high 
debt at corporate and sovereign levels. They got impacted with this huge shock and they have limited uh, policy space to uh, really react to it. So what that means for many of these countries is a loss, really long lasting damage and the need for um, international community to really get together to support them, both in terms of addressing the crisis, but also really putting in place policies going forward for sustained long-term growth, which is really critical for many of the issues discussed today, um, in, of course, in the context of sustainable development goals. So um, we have, of course, there are many uncertainties, but we estimate additional financing needs for developing countries uh, are very high. The pandemic-related external financing gaps uh, for the IDA countries, which are the poorest countries, can be in the range of uh, 50 to 100 billion dollars per year. We have been uh, working as the World Bank Group on an exceptional crisis response. We are going to provide 160 billion dollars of financing by June 2021. This includes 50 billion dollars of total on grant and highly concessional credit terms to the IDA countries. And we have been implementing COVID-19 emergency fast track health programs in over 100 developing economies, uh, which has been an unprecedented scale and speed um, in a, a very limited time. In terms of our um, work going forward, we will look at the three stages of relief, restructuring, and resilient recovery, which of course includes the emergency support for health interventions to save lives threatened by the virus, a social response for protecting the poor and vulnerable people from the impact of the economic and the social crisis triggered by the pandemic, the economic response to save livelihood, preserving jobs and ensuring more sustainable business growth and job creation by helping firms and financial institutions survive the initial crisis shock, restructure, which will be very much needed in the um, over the coming years and recapitalize to build resilience in recovery and focus support for strengthening policies, institutions and investments together with our uh, private arm IFC for resilient and sust sustainable recovery, including digital connectivity. So rebuilding better for the future. The G20 has uh, led uh, the debt service suspension initiative. This was announced in April. This was a very important uh, step. We work very uh, closely with the G20, both ourselves and, and uh, IMF. The debt service payments by all official bilateral creditors were suspended as of May 1 to, to make space for the much needed fiscal um, uh, resources to fight the health and economic impact of the crisis. But this is just the first step. Much more is needed for also uh, middle-income countries, which who are also face, which are also facing um, this crisis. And the governments of the G20 countries called for comparable state uh, treatment by commercial creditors. But this expectation uh, has not been uh, implemented by the private sector creditors yet. And this is particularly critical given what I have um, just mentioned given the deepening poverty in the debtor country and the amount of resources that are needed for them to address the crisis, but also emerge um, uh, better from, from it. We have been working very closely with uh, many of our partners like the WHO, WTO, OECD, UN, other MDBs, and of course uh, the IMF. These range from health uh, emergencies, working together as a platform to procurement, um, of health supplies uh, with other MDBs, education, food security, which is a major concern, as well as, uh, of course, broader policies to support better recovery. But more, more will be needed. Uh, the G20 is critical uh, in this uh, aspect. I think the meetings in July, as well as in the fall, will be very critical to bring the global community together. We need a scaled up worldwide action uh, to overcome the pandemic, but also the long lasting scars from the pandemic. This is true, of course, in the initial phases of the medical response. It's true in the scientific research towards a vaccine and effective therapies. And it's also critical for a sustainable economic recovery and maintaining order in the trade uh, system. I'm sure we'll hear more about this and resolving the pending debt 
issues are really a priority. So I would like to end on a positive note because uh, this was a very grim uh, presentation. We are actually very worried about what the implications are and, and, and urgency of the need to act together. But I also think, um, but we also think COVID-19 may provide opportunities as we build better for a more sustainable uh, future but this does require multilateral coordination and I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak on some of these issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and uh, let me uh, now turn to Martin. Martin, the mic is yours. You're still muted, uh, unmute. Uh, I think he is he's, I think he's gone. Uh, All right. So you, let's see. Back. Can you see me and hear me now? Uh, we can hear you and see you. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Sorry about the little mishap. <laughs> um, so thank you again for having me, first of all. Um, it's, uh, it's really uplifting to see um, so many uh, bright minds and people uh, all around the world coming together for this event, thinking about uh, ways to, to build a better future. And I really would like to thank the, the Saudi G20 presidency for organizing the event. I've listened to some of the presentation. Uh, I think we all get a lot of uh, impulses for our work out of that. Um, indeed, the crisis has shown the, the importance of, of multilateralism like never before. Um, at the beginning, when we all were really concerned about how this would evolve in the, in the depths of uh, concerns about uh, health, about markets, about the future of the economy, what has always been uplifting is to uh, sit together with colleagues from around the world in many uh, of these multilateral meetings, whether it's within our institution, the IMF, or whether it's across uh, international institutions or with the G20 or in, in uh, civil society forums, to see everybody trying to figure out how to move forward on this issue and how to um, solve the, crisis, the health crisis and then uh, prevent lasting economic damage. Let me talk a little bit about what the IMF has done uh, in, in this context and then um, also draw a few conclusions regarding um, how we need to make multilateralism work um, in this context. I, I'm not going to speak much about our outlook because we're going to come out with it officially, I think, next week. So I don't want to uh, preempt our research department. But let me just tell you, in terms of defense response, we've been able to draw on our resources, as you know, to help many countries that would otherwise have uh, experienced great difficulties. We have um, active interest of about 100 countries for our emergency financing. We've already um, fulfilled requests of about 60 for, for large amounts of money. We have increased the access limits and will probably increase them further for this type of assistance to help countries that um, uh, have at the moment nowhere else to go because, uh, as you know, the, the market has uh, a very differentiated uh, look at countries at the moment. And there are many for, for whom the IMF is, uh, in terms of, of the, the volumes and, and the degree of need they need, uh, really the land of last resort. And we're trying our best to fulfill that, that function. But we have also kind of cast our eyes on uh, possible concerns going forward. Uh, what, what could be the next stage of the crisis? We know that the virus is spreading in many countries and emerging markets also. Um, and um, the world economy as a whole is probably not yet uh, over, the, uh, over the, the peak of the crisis, so to speak. So we need to, we need to think about what countries could, help going f could need going forward. And there uh, we have deployed, for example, uh, our precautionary tools for some countries. Um, you may have uh, read the discussion about our um, uh, short-term liquidity line that is now available to countries. And we believe that our toolkit provides insurance for those countries that um, are in a good position right now, but are con may be concerned about uh, volatility going forward. 
and we want to be um, uh, we want to have the tools to help these countries too and um, the reforms that our executive board have passed lately and the the active um, engagement with the uh, two more countries on for example the the FCL which is our, our platinum facility if you want has shown that um, these tools are quite relevant <clears throat> we also of course like the the bank and others are engaged in um, in, in economic analysis and policy advice and there it's not only how to fight the crisis but uh, how to uh, think about the recovery and what kind of recovery we we should aim for um, the crisis has an opportunity because there will be massive structural change and massive uh, government investment needed going forward to build our economies a little bit differently. And uh, whether we think about uh, climate change or digital economies, a more inclusive labor market, these type of policies, um, we need to think about from a macro level. Uh, our colleagues in the other institutions need to think about it from their uh, perspective and mandate. And uh, that's gonna be also a key activity going forward that has already started at the, at the fund. Shayla mentioned the, the debt relief initiative, which is another important element. Um, and here we are very grateful for the leadership of the G20 in um, uh, bringing the Paris Club and, and other countries together in, a, in an initiative to uh, relieve uh, the poorest countries of their debt service uh, burden, at least for this year. And uh, I hope that we can extend the initiative. I'm sure there will be some uh, need for that uh, until until next year and uh, that provides important liquidity for countries that need to finance health spending and uh, would not otherwise be um, benefiting from uh, from fast liquidity provision besides our um, uh, facilities um, we have tried as you know to um, also uh, help countries with the general sdr allocation but that has not found a majority in our board it would have been another major liquidity injections that would have helped, especially the poorer countries. Um, of course, we have done also our homework at the IMF. We have um, a facility that helps countries um, also uh, alleviate their debt service to the IMF, to us specifically. Um, that has been very well implemented and all the, the 29 countries that are eligible for it have, I think by now, received that relief. Now, in terms of multilateralism, what has enabled us to do this? The fund is a multilateral institution. And um, why has the fund been able to pull off that relatively uh, fast and, and uh, in, in terms of country numbers, really unprecedented response? Well, first of all, um, as in other institutions, our shareholders um, that are in many cases the same as, for example, the World Bank or other, uh, other IFIs, they recognize that. Um, a combined health and financial crisis would really hurt everybody. So it's very difficult in a, in a health uh, crisis in an epidemic to localize the, 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 um, the, the, the crisis um, as long as there are people moving across borders, as you know, we will continue to do. Um, the crisis has to be fought back in every country. And for that, we need to provide the economic resources to all countries. And likewise, if <clears throat> there are major financial crises in countries around the world, it will always come back to other countries as well. So we really do have a joint interest here and uh, our shareholders have recognized that and therefore they have been willing to provide us with the resources and the, the, uh, the flexibility to, to, to do our response. We have also built up over 75 years um, a lot of trust in the funds established rules and procedures. They are very well understood. Um, people generally know quite well what we can do and what we cannot do. And um, that common understanding has, has helped us um, kind of move forward relatively quickly. It, um, it, it um, comes together with a relative independence of, of the IMF staff. Um, as you know, it's, it's, it's uh, run by the managing director. She is the head of staff and the chairman of the board. And um, our, um, our board, of course, has the uh, overall decisions at the end, but the way it works at the fund and has been for a long time is that the staff does the analysis, provides recommendations, and in many cases, the board follows these recommendations relatively closely because of the level of trust that is there, uh, the dialogue between the shareholders and the fund. And um, we have been able to mobilize that, that goodwill to, to the best of the global economy in this case. 
and also what what is important i think is that <clears throat> uh, to maintain that common understanding and the trust is that there is a huge network of uh, finance and central bank professionals around the world that um, has collaborated in in many um, for example g20 presidencies in the past uh, many of them have been at the fund or uh, have come to the fund from uh, institutions and ministries abroad and uh, that exchange and that professional network has has really kind of delivered um, uh, to, to the benefit of, uh, of of global citizens this time as it has done before now will this always work um, going forward can we preserve this type of uh, functioning multilateralism that um, uh, as other institutions have known is not something we should take for granted and there I would perhaps see three things one is um, we need to demonstrate that we are capable of safeguarding our resources in a, in a responsible way and by that I mean that for example in the emergency financing one of the big debates with every program is is the money well spent are countries using the funds that they're getting to really fight the crisis and how can we ensure that um, we had to provide uh, some, some, some ideas to our board, uh, like, for example, asking countries to do uh, post-crisis audits of how money was spent. Uh, you may have heard our managing director say, um, by all means, do spend, but keep the receipts. And so that sense of accountability is something that has been very strong in the membership. Um, we are always kind of uh, held to task whether we reach the objectives in the end. And also... Um, shareholders are very concerned that the fund doesn't help in um, uh, financing an unsustainable debt build-up that could hurt countries after the crisis. So the idea of debt sustainability is, is uh, mired into our uh, facilities and um, even for the emergency financing we need to have a very good look at whether countries will be able to um, help themselves even after the crisis. And of course that um, is something that is associated with a lot of uncertainty and um, uh, we, we have been careful not to um, be too strict on that, but um, in some cases we have actually helped countries not only benefit from the debt relief, but also engage in some debt restructuring that will help them also in the years going forward. And that's always something that we need to keep in mind. The, the second point I would uh, like to make is that the, the policies that the IMF recommends they need to find also social acceptance. Um, as you know, there's a perception that some countries don't want to come to the fund because of stigma effects, because they feel that they may be um, forced by the international community um, into um, certain types of policies that they do not prefer. Um, there is a concern that uh, the IMF is pushing too much austerity. And it's up to us, to the fund, to really demonstrate that this is not the case and that we're kind of trying to really uh, find a balance between helping countries restore growth very quickly and also minimizing um, the, the impact of any adjustment that, that may have to be done um, on especially the, um, the poorer segments of the population. And uh, there we need to be really alert to um, the discussion among um, uh, civil society. Uh, we need to, to work very closely with other institutions on how to minimize the impact. Um, social spending policies are important, as I mentioned. And, um, and then we need to demonstrate, as I said before, that um, we help countries grow into a, a better future where we take into account um, things such as um, equality, climate, um, digitalization, and so forth. Now, the last, the third point I would like to make that um, we will need to watch. Martin, can you please, please uh, summarize the last point and then yeah. we... Yep. Yeah. Um, the, the last point is a very important one, which is that the the representation of countries in the IMF needs to evolve over time. We need to, we need to have an institution that is representative of all members. And um, uh, it ties directly into our resources that the fund has, because we need to upgrade our resources every now and then, and that is called the quota reform. And at the same time, we also need to discuss the influence and the voting shares of countries in the IMF. And for us, this will be a challenge going forward as we go through more of these quota rounds to ensure that all countries are properly represented. And otherwise, uh, multilateralism will be very difficult to, to maintain if countries feel that they don't have a voice uh, according to their, their influence in the global economy in the IMF. And these are the kind of challenges that we need to watch going forward. Uh, thank, thank you. you. And, uh, third point, thank you, Mark.
think the third point is uh, a, a, an important point, and it was an issue of discussion on the per, on the first day uh, here at the T20 Web Conference, uh, and it was a question that was addressed to the um, chair of the finance track um, uh, in the G20 Saudi Secretariat. Uh, maybe we'll come back to you uh, uh, on this for, if time allows. Uh, now we uh, turn to um, Alan. Alan uh, Wolf, um, you have uh, 10 minutes uh, or 8 to 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to Saudi Arabia and to the G20 for the invitation to participate in this valuable series of panels that are taking place over these three days uh, on policy recommendations for the post COVID 19 world. Uh, the WTO during the pandemic has fulfilled a number of key functions. First, it has gathered notifications of uh, COVID-19 related trade um, uh, uh, actions from individual members, uh, uh, made them available to all members and to the public. It is, secondly, it has issued its trade forecast estimating the drop-off in trade that's likely to take place this year uh, from as you know, 13 to 32% uh, is the range of estimates, uh, as well as the uh, likely recovery in the next year. Um, third, it has provided a forum for sharing proposals from members and considering potential collective responses. Uh, all these activities allowed members to make their own policy decisions on the basis of important information. The number of autonomous trade liberalizing measures introduced by individual members, both in terms of removing tariffs and uh, smoothing entry for critical supplies, have outnumbered uh, the export restrictions. Export restrictions uh, on food, uh, in many cases, have already been rolled back or terminated because the, the world actually has a very good supply of food, much better than during the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Uh, this is not to suggest the multilateral trading system could not do more to limit harms to trade and the global economy in the future, far from it. Uh, there will likely still be challenges for the duration of the pandemic. In 1918, the flu epidemic claimed 50 million lives and uh, came in three waves, the, the worst of which was the second. The potential for limited availability of vaccines going forward could well be highly problematic for the world trading system and for the health situation around the world. In addition, there is a need to uh, aid in the economic recovery. So where are the current rules the least pres prescriptive? That's where they can be strengthened. Where collective action would be helpful, it can be fostered. A logical next step would be to build upon initiatives that have been filed at the WTO, led by Korea, Canada, Singapore, New Zealand, and Switzerland, as well as most recently, this last Monday, the Ottawa Group of countries and the Cairns Group to give coherent direction for the crafting of national trade policies. So let me give you some specifics that have been uh, raised by members. Uh, a major effort can be undertaken to increase transparency. Uh, member notifications can be supplemented by enhanced monitoring and reporting of measures by the Secretariat. There's little guidance in the WTO rules as to the appropriate use of export controls where it is felt that there exists short supply. Further guidance could be crafted. Sometimes the, existing, uh, the existence of extensive policy space is contrary to the common interests of all. Uh, every government likes to have policy space. It also would like to have its neighbors have less policy space. Uh, so there's a balance to be drawn. Uh, government interventions to procure needed supplies reduce the scope for market forces to determine competitive outcomes. A number of practices that we witnessed recently in the last three months in response to the pandemic are not explicitly regulated by the WTO rules and included under this heading would be subsidization contingent on supply of the domestic market, uh, preemptive government purchasing, preemptive government investment. We're seeing that continuing now. Additional disciplines could be considered. 
Leaving the allocation of scarce necessities to solely market forces may also not be complete, completely satisfactory if the poorest countries are priced out of the market. Consideration can also be given to agreeing, as in the WTO agreement on agriculture, to, con to consider the effect on others of applying export restrictions. That does not apply to industrial goods. So there could be a provision of that sort. Additional provisions could provide for prior notice before export restrictions are put into place and a commitment to engage in timely consultations. Consideration can be given to including in any restrictions a sunset clause and providing for a rollback of existing restrictions. Multilaterally agreed guidance could be given for the sharing of scarce medical supplies, including vaccines. Concerted efforts could be made to have relevant tariff liberalization, not just for medical goods, equipment and pharmaceuticals, but more broadly. Consideration can be given to a member's emergency task force or other mechanism to flesh out options for consideration by the entire membership of the WTO, 164 members. Where options are devised by groups of members, an effort and process are needed to gain broader member support and to assure implementation of concrete steps forward. A long range policy planning network for the multilateral trading system can be created. This is a function that every government should have and most do have, particularly with respect to defense and budget, environment, health and social services. That does not really exist for the multilateral trading system. Uh, this insufficient attention paid to assessing the future needs of that system in part due to the daily need to deal with current challenges. The multilateral trading system is uniquely positioned to provide a forum for meeting global challenges. Subsidies cannot be negotiated bilaterally and still be sufficiently effective. That's subsidies disciplines. Bilateral agreements on sharing scarce medical supplies would only further erode the principle of non-discrimination upon which the trading system was founded. I do not believe that the multilateral trading system has failed or is about to fail. The common belief that this is the case is due to excessive, although understandable, focus on where the rules are inadequate, to the exclusion of where the rules currently uh, are covering uh, situations. Most of the world trade is conducted still on the basis of WTO rules not through regional, not through bilateral trade agreements or through unilateral actions. Of course, compliance with the WTO rules could be and should be improved. I do not believe that the trading nations of the world will retreat into policies of general autarky. There will be some reshoring of medical production, some stockpiling of medical supplies and pharmaceuticals, some diversification of foreign sources of supply, but Complete self-sufficiency has economic limits and other practical limits and is unnecessary. Mutual commitments of openness to trade is a more effective solution than a unilateral closing of borders, both to meet objective security, as well as products needed to deal with the pandemic. The WTO is about promoting global well-being, and that includes development. Global international trade can benefit all nations. Building capacity allows developing countries ultimately to enjoy all of the benefits of the trading system and be in a position to fulfill all of its obligations. The multilateral trading system must of necessity aspire to universality. Having those nations which are still outside the WTO exceed to the WTO should be an objective for all. We have 164 members, the fund has 198. Uh, clearly, there's, uh, there are 23 who are seeking entry, and uh, that process could be accelerated. I am sanguine but realistic about challenges to the multilateral trading system, populism and nationalism, and over-reliance on bilateral approaches will not in the long run prevail over wider cooperation. So in conclusion, in conclusion the, prices, the crisis of the pandemic is a time of opportunity to improve the WTO and the multilateral trading system, to improve its relevance, its resilience in a time of crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, and now we uh, turn to uh, Adam.
Good afternoon. Uh, Your Royal Highness, Prince Turki Ali Fawzal, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, my dear friends at COPSARC, uh, all protocols observed. Thank you for the floor. Assalamu alaikum. I'm very pleased to represent the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, in this conference, but in many ways, I think it's much bigger than that. I feel like I'm scrambling uh, for my very livelihood as the core premise of multilateralism is called into question. I've spent the last 25 years in the United Nations in a range of capacities at both the headquarters and field levels. The interconnectedness of the world, the way our actions on one side of the globe impact on others far away is patently obvious to me, but maybe I'm being a bit myopic. So I started to think a bit about my, my past and, and different examples just resonated. For example, I recall being stunned by the complexity and social and economic linkages that were required to see raw opium poppy from a remote village in Badakhshan, Afghanistan, make its way to the needle of a heroin addict in, in London when I worked with the Office on Drugs and Crime. Or time I spent in the Horn of Africa where drought had killed off livestock, livestock that would be normally sold uh, to countries like Saudi Arabia where I'm presently posted for Eid feasts after Ramadan. Or the loss of global remittances uh, with COVID-19 that are estimated at 110 billion. So in short, examples of global and regional interconnectedness are numerous. And in this panel, I suspect that I'm preaching to the converted and many of the task forces that spoke earlier today are pointing to that. So why is the value of multilateralism being called into question? Why now, when we have a global crisis that requires global action, actions that can only be mobilized through multilateralism? So while the world is going through the most devastating crisis in over a century, the state of multilateralism to address it is fraying in many ways, including in the fight against this pandemic and more broadly in the global sustainable, uh, sustainable development agenda. So today I want to look at, at three topics, the current state of multilateralism, second, the future of multilateralism, and third, how the COVID crisis shows interdependence that requires collective responsibility. So first on the issue of the current state of multilateralism, the voices of nationalism and protectionism gained strength over the last few years with governments being increasingly tempted to pursue inward looking policies through unilateral or ad hoc measures in a competitive way rather than working together. Large segments of societies believe that retreating from openness and cooperation is the solution to their anxiety. However, standalone policies cannot provide sustainable and effective solutions to global challenges like the health crisis we're facing or climate or trade and sovereign states need to prioritize cooperation and collective action. COVID-19, uh, I think was a bit of a catalyst. It exacerbated the tendency uh, with border closures and travel restrictions, which naturally from a health perspective were required under these circumstances. Uh, I do find it curious though that social labeling kind of went along with this COVID crisis. It was initially an Asian problem, a Chinese problem, then it was an Italian problem, then it was now maybe more a US problem or a Brazilian problem. And quite clearly, we're now landing in the, firmly in the issue that this is a global problem. Uh, and to tackle global challenges, multilateralism is more than ever indispensable as a multipolar world without multilateralism would be the worst case scenario. The world is going through geopolitical and economic power shifts. And over the last three decades, globalization has accelerated economic convergence and power shifts, deepened interdependence and intensified the need for cooperation. Second, on the future of multilateralism. Amid these threats and attacks against the multilateral system, the battle for the future uh, has commenced. And all these years uh, in this business, I've heard so many times, uh, well, sure, the UN has its problems, but you know, what's the alternative? Um, and well, quite simply, I mean, at the risk of oversimplifying, we have three alternative systems that are emerging. The first alternative is a system dominated by bilateral deals in which international trade and international law are absent. This would apply not only to trade, but also to migration, displacement, conflicts. It would also minimize the role of international financial institutions and maybe end the G20-led multilateral effort to prevent a race to the bottom by corporations' tax optimization strategies. In its extreme form, this vision becomes one in which the law of the jungle prevails and discards all efforts to provide global public good and manage spillover effects. The second system would no longer attempt to establish global rules, but regional or like-minded country groupings might formulate their own sets of rules. This kind of system would accommodate the differences and preferences countries may have, 
uh, as there is a clear demand for some differentiation in rules and standards to accommodate varying preferences. The third alternative is the current system in which countries use global multilateralism to foster global policies and to enforce common rules. This system includes many regional organizations at the top of the system, whoever sit global multilateral institutions like the UN, IMF, World Bank, my colleagues representing uh, those institutions here today with the aim of advancing global common good. I'm the first to acknowledge that many international organizations need to be reformed to represent these new world realities. Uh, but reform processes often fall short because of the lack of consensus in the membership. When we hear outcries that the UN should do this or the UN needs to do that, I need to remind uh, the listeners today that the UN is a collection of member states. Uh, much as we might like to be independent or err on the side of science and justice and equality, we too have bosses to answer to. Uh, third on the issue of the COVID crisis shows uh, interdependence that requires collective responsibility. Given the degree of interdependence, not only of the world's economies, but of the world's societies, it's clear that a strongly fragmented system would be unable to deliver sought after global public good and sustainable development. Growing interdependence has increased vulnerability to volatility and shocks in, in varying ways. Obviously COVID is the most striking example of that, but also trade, migration, urbanization, finance, environment, uh, with repercussions across countries and across regions. COVID has shown how global value chains increasingly intertwined, uniting exports, imports, technology, and intellectual property make it difficult to tell where an iPhone was actually produced among the half, different, half dozen different countries that might have been involved. COVID forces us to take on board the basic principles that we must all be responsible for the future and must always act with survival of the planet and humankind in mind. Moreover, governments can still maintain sovereignty while they live up to collective responsibility. So with all this uncertainty, uh, what is our global collective compass? I'd suggest that it must remain the 2030 agenda. And it, it is the blueprint towards sustainable development for all and to recover better from this crisis and subsequent crises. And there will be more. As repeatedly said by the UN Secretary General, the 2030 agenda offers an unprecedented opportunity to reframe economic and development policy around sustainability, inclusiveness, the leave no one behind uh, agenda, resilience and innovation. It gives the direction to recover better from the COVID-19 crisis. The 2030 agenda highlights the cross-cutting and cross-national nature of global challenges. Here in this forum, I call on the think tanks and academic communities to be more bold and more vocal than you might've been in the past. Now is the time for science-based decisions instead of political decisions that might be based on power grabbing or political expediency. We must embed decision makers with intelligence and encourage knowledge sharing. Finally, let me bring us back to the G20 and its partnership with the UN system. By bringing together large advanced and emerging economies at the leaders level, the emergence of the G20 in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis was a major innovation in the international system. However, as the prime forum for international economic cooperation, it must show its effectiveness now more than ever to address global challenges and engage with the world community at large. The continuous engagement of the UN system with the G20 helped to design policy frameworks, for example, the G20 Action Plan on the 2030 Agenda, which mainstreamed the universal agenda for sustainable development into all G20 actions. The UN will need to keep the momentum going with the G20 to further contribute to the 2030 Agenda and better represent the multilateral, longer term and cross-cutting approaches to sustainable development for all of us. And finally, I would say that strong leadership is critical now. Uh, this is a time I'm quite excited to be working and based in, uh, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where there is strong leadership, where uh, they do see the role of the G20 as um, intimately connected with every person in the world. You know, it's very, very humanized here and they should be given credit for that approach. This is a time to be leaders. I think we're at a moment now where certainly, while there are flaws in our multilateral system, uh, this is a system that gives sufficient breadth. It re, uh, realizes all the complexities at the most remote areas of the world uh, and shows that all of us are, are human at the end of the day and all of us uh, need to work together. So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll conclude. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adam. Uh, and. Uh... Before I give the mic to Luis, I would remind our attendees or uh, our audience in the digital room uh, that uh, 
we will have uh, about 15 minutes for a Q&A session at the end of um, this panel. Uh, so if you are, um, if you have a question, um, you don't need to put it on the chat. You can raise a hand and then we will give you the mic at the end of the, uh, of the panel. Uh, Luis, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fahad. Uh, thanks for the for the invitation to participate in this panel. It's a great pleasure to see uh, to see you and, uh, and 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 old friends and uh, and to be part of this conversation. Let let me congratulate you, Fahad, and the Saudi presidency for the very high level of the contributions uh, that were put together across the different uh, task forces uh, that uh, have uh, presented their work today, and also for having raised the profile. Uh, of the T20 during these uh, very challenging times. Um, a, a lot has been said uh, on the panel, uh, but I think I would probably, in the few minutes that I have, uh, highlight a few points uh, where multilateral cooperation is particularly important. Uh, there are several areas that come to mind, the crisis response, public health, trade and investment, climate change is another one. So if you allow me, if I had, I'll probably try to, uh, to say a few words about all of those. Uh, but first, when it comes to crisis response, in this area, it's really important to recall the magnitude of the economic and social impacts uh, of the pandemic. Um, we have been, uh, uh, or we published uh, very recently our economic outlook with our projections for the global economy, uh, and the numbers are, are really uh, 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 of a magnitude that is, that is unprecedented in the last few decades. Um, in our uh, main scenario, one that basically um, assumes that the, 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 the current wave of the pandemic uh, subsides, uh, global output could fall by 6% this year. Uh, it would begin to recover in the second half of this, uh, of this year and so on. But even in that case, in many advanced economies, the equivalent of five years or more of per capita real income growth could be lost by the end of next year as a result of this lump. If there is a second wave uh, of this crisis, uh, then the uh, economic toll would be, uh, would be much greater than that. We could have a global GDP declining by about 8% this year and to remain well short of its pre-crisis levels by the end of uh, 2021. So huge uh, human, economic, social uh, losses associated with, uh, with this pandemic. And also, uh, Jayla has already mentioned it, but I thought I would uh, reiterate the fact that we are not talking about a long-term, e a short-term effect, but there are also very, very important long-term legacies that are associated with this, with this crisis. Uh, in particular, unemployment. Uh, unemployment is already high in many parts of the world. There is a risk that many people could become trapped in longer-term uh, unemployment spells. Uh, the most vulnerable ones could be uh, basically fall the greatest risk uh, of falling in, in, in inactivity uh, or being trapped in uh, long-term joblessness. Uh, this risk of, uh, of, uh, of uh, protracted unemployment could even uh, contribute to widening uh, the inequalities uh, that we've seen uh, already in the world before, before the crisis. Also investment, investment was already weak before uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, hit. Uh, it's likely to remain weak uh, as a result of the economic slump, and that adds to those long-term uh, uh, effects that we can expect to have on the potential growth of our, of our economies. All that uh, compounded by the fact that we are going to come out of this crisis with a much more uh, challenging um, uh, debt uh, outlook. So it will be important also to think of uh, uh, ways to restore the sustainability of the public finances in a way that does not undermine economic growth or other objectives of public policy as economies begin to recover from this. So why am I saying all this? Well, first of all, context, and also because multilateral cooperation will be very important uh, in this area. Very important because countries can learn from each other. They can learn about the most effective policies that can be provided in the near term to buttress the recovery, but they can also learn from each other um, to address uh, the likely longer term scarring effects uh, of this crisis as, uh, as, as, as has been mentioned uh, before. We at the OECD, what we are doing uh, to contribute to that, uh, to this process of mutual learning is basically to stock, to take stock of the measures that have been put in place in different parts of the world, uh, to start working uh, on analyzing those measures uh, and trying to identify the ones that are 
uh, that have worked best uh, in terms of meeting the objectives for which they were they were putting uh, put in place. It's also important to learn a lot now from past experience uh, in terms of uh, what countries can do as policy shifts now from rescue towards recovery and towards addressing these longer term challenges that uh, were already uh, uh, with us uh, before the crisis. We created a digital hub uh, where we are taking stock of these policy measures and we are, we are making available a number of thematic policy notes uh, that can help uh, share um, our analysis to date, uh, insights from policy discussions with countries uh, as they face these common challenges uh, that, we, uh, that, that, that we've been talking about. So I invite you all uh, to visit that, uh, that web page and the material that, uh, that is available there. Let me also recognize the efforts that have been made by uh, the international community, the G7, the G20 leaders, you know, their commitment to doing whatever it takes uh, to ensure that uh, uh, a strong global response uh, to the crisis, uh, tackling these challenges that we've been talking about, uh, exchanging experience on that. Uh, both uh, Jayla and Martin mentioned uh, the initiatives in the area of debt relief. I think that's a very important, uh, already tangible outcome of efforts uh, at, uh, by the international uh, community in those areas. The, the EU members, that's another example uh, of efforts that have been uh, put into finding new ins instruments to address uh, common challenges uh, by different parts of the, of the world. One word on vaccines, because that's one of the critical elements that we need uh, to uh, make sure that we can come out of this crisis uh, as soon and as robustly as possible. I think there, there are a number of issues that can be mentioned. One is obviously uh, the importance of international cooperation uh, to create incentives for the completion of the most promising uh, R&D projects that are in place uh, to come up with a, a new, with a vaccine or new treatment uh, for this, uh, for this uh, pandemic. Uh, also issues related to large scale manufacturing capacity that will need to be built even before we know uh, which candidates will be successful in this production uh, of, of, of a vaccine. And thirdly, the rules that will need to be agreed on by the international community uh, to manage intellectual property rights, procurement, to ensure that there is equitable access uh, of affordable uh, uh, supply of, uh, of, of vaccines and treatment as we go along. Uh, another area is trade and investment. Uh, Alan has already made uh, uh, an intervention on that. I would just, uh, you know, obviously echo the need uh, to make sure that uh, policies and agreements uh, uh, that can be reached uh, will avoid uh, uh, forfeiting the benefits of globalization. We know that benefits have been huge uh, over the last decade, so uh, we need to make sure that uh, we don't forfeit that uh, as we go along and create a, a more robust, uh, robust mechanisms uh, for trade and investment around the, around the world. A third area that I mentioned, climate change and biodiversity. And here I mentioned biodiversity because it's, it's extremely important since we're talking about the pandemic. Uh, that is closely linked to it, uh, closely linked to the transmission of zoonotic diseases and all the other aspects related to it. Also a very important theme for the next year's COP uh, uh, in Kunming. Uh, so uh, important to also put that at the center stage uh, in, in, in multilateral efforts uh, uh, in that area. Obviously the challenge here is that reaching even a moderately ambitious target for green uh, um, greenhouse gra gas uh, concentration at a manageable cost will be difficult unless many countries, industries and emission sources as possible are engaged in action uh, to, to meet those, uh, those targets. International cooperation could obviously facilitate the implementation of instruments that would help uh, uh, concentrating the emission cuts uh, where they are least costly uh, and for the benefit uh, of all. Uh, also, another area where multilateral cooperation uh, would be extremely valuable uh, is in the area of public investment to promote and accelerate the development and deployment of green technologies uh, in support of the recovery and in support of stronger performance uh, um, as, we, as we come out of this, uh, of this immediate crisis uh, uh, period and we build uh, a more robust global economy uh, in, the years, in the years ahead. Um, it is true that we have been talking uh, uh, on this panel and throughout the last three days about uh, very difficult uh, times uh, and the challenges that we're facing are obviously commensurate 
uh, with uh, the difficulties and the complexities of the policy challenges that we are, that we are facing. But um, I think we should all bear in mind that international cooperation and renewed commitment to multilateralism would certainly put us all on a much stronger footing to withstand the shock, to recover from it, and to make sure that we are better prepared uh, as, we, as we come out of this crisis to withstand similar ones uh, should they happen. And I, I certainly hope that we will not face that in our lifetimes, but should they happen, that we will be uh, better prepared and we will have uh, better tools uh, to make sure that, uh, that uh, we come out of it uh, in much more strongly uh, than, we, than we enter this crisis. With that, uh, Fahad, I will probably stop here uh, with a big thank you to, uh, to you uh, and to colleagues uh, um, in, 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 uh, who, who have been working and supporting the Saudi uh, uh, presidency uh, in putting this uh, fantastic event together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. Just, just in time. Um, so we have um, a very insightful and in interesting um, introductory remarks from uh, our esteemed panel, uh, panelists. Um, I, I have same very interesting points, and I would like to follow up with, um, uh, with, uh, with many of you. But I am mindful of the, of the time, and I always, uh, we always give little time to, to the audience. And um, for this time, we will just turn to our uh, audience. Uh, we have two hands uh, being raised, uh, Romana Aziz uh, and Mohammed Tariq. Um, if you, um, if we can turn the mic to them, um, and um, both Rom Romana, we can start with you. If you can ask the question, uh, introduce yourself, and if you can also identify who the question is directed to. And then we will take another question from Hamad Uh, uh Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Uh, no, my uh, question was answered during the presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Hamad? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you ask a question briefly? Yes, thank you for uh, this opportunity to uh, ask a question. I am um, working as a chief sustainability officer in Tanmiya Food Company, which is uh, one of the third biggest large uh, poultry production company in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm working on a project to um, convert uh, waste to energy and uh, I am looking for a process. Uh, uh, the project is related to a technology which will convert waste to energy and then uh, this will be 100% carbon negative because we will capture the carbon uh, and we will also produce water in this, uh, in this process. And uh, the other main uh, Output of this process will be the biochar, which we will use for agriculture purpose, which is a carbon negative, uh, uh, carbon negative product. Uh, we will capture carbon from uh, bio biomass and we will store it in the as a fertilizer in the land. And uh, this uh, biochar is also used for uh, carbon nanotubes and also for uh, in, in application in construction. Like we can replace um, cement. Uh, with the biochar and that uh, building can be carbon negative also. Uh, yeah. So, and one of the new technology which is introduced is to also to produce uh, ear protein from this uh, output. So, I'm looking for uh, funding to this project, which is like a 10 million euro project. Uh, is there any opportunity for this? Ahmed, may I interrupt? Uh, thank you. I, I, I think this is outside the the scope of this uh, of this panel. So I would just uh, turn back to uh, our esteemed members of the of this panel, and I would go back to Adam and uh, Alan. Uh, you both mentioned um, um, Alan. You mentioned the need for reform. The multilateral system is not uh, failing. Uh, the WTO is, is not failing, but probably there is a room for uh, for improvement. Uh, and also, Adam, you mentioned uh, uh, the status quo, the future, um, the, um, uh, the independence of, um, of the international organizations and being, um, uh, I wouldn't say victims of, of, of the voting system, but, uh, but it is uh, in terms of the quota and 
uh, and so on. Uh, my question to both of you um, is, um, is, is this pandemic an opportunity uh, to reform? And I think there is an agreement on this. Um, what are the steps that can be taken to ensure that the international community recognizes this need to reform and move forward on, on, on such a reform? Um, and what are the threats to this opportunity? Uh, briefly, we'll start with Alan and then uh, Adam. Um, Alan? What has taken place uh, over time? And as you know, the G20 in the past called for reform before there was a pandemic. So WTO reform has been on the agenda. It did not specify what the reform should aim at. Uh, probably it was triggered by the appellate body uh, in dispute settlement ceasing to function or about to cease to function, which did happen. Uh, but actually, the, the most serious problem has been the absence of multilateral agreements. Uh, the, uh, uh, the consensus system has been taken to the extreme of uh, requiring unanimity. Uh, and that's not what consensus should mean. Consensus should be uh, most want to go in a particular direction and others are willing to acquiesce in that even if they're not willing to join and actively supporting that direction. So what's happened? In December of 2017, uh, several initiatives, including on uh, digital economy, e-commerce, were launched among the like-minded and they're carrying that through to conclusion uh, and more and more uh, members have joined. Uh, so uh, that holds a lot of promise. The COVID-19 uh, crisis has led to quite a number of initiatives being put on the table, starting with uh, Singapore and New Zealand showing the way. Singapore and Australia had also an agreement. Um, uh, I should say New Zealand and, and uh, Singapore. Uh, uh, and uh, Canada has uh, organized an Ottawa group of uh, most of the, uh, uh, mostly representative of the institution uh, of uh, 13 countries, uh, including the European Union, uh, and uh, quite a number of good suggestions are being put on the table, and I think they'll gain momentum. So uh, what's the, the threat is uh, that uh, we don't rise to the occasion, uh, that we don't make the improvements that are needed, uh, but the members are rallying, and uh, it's, uh, we usually, uh, each round of negotiations has taken uh, something on the order of eight years. Uh, we are trying to get something done in a matter of months, uh, and that's new and different. And it, there are some promising uh, green shoots coming through of a, a sort of a spring for uh, coming to grips with what needs to become uh, what, what we need to be doing. So I'm optimistic, uh, but uh, we must really not fail at this time to uh, make some needed changes. Uh, it's not that the system is irrelevant in, to world trade in general. It has not proved sufficiently relevant to meeting this particular crisis. So there have to be some improvements made. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, Adam? Uh, thanks. I, the United Nations has been in a state of reform since I joined in 1995. So it's not as if it's a new topic. You know, the, the UN has been reforming in many different ways, uh, you know, continually uh, as, it, as, it, uh, as it's challenged by new, new issues. You know, how the UN deploys in peacekeeping, how procurement has been streamlined, uh, how the movement of staff between agencies has been simplified with, with all of its, its challenges. So it's an ongoing process. I think COVID more than anything has, has shown that um, we have come together. And, and if you look at how uh, very relatively quickly uh, the General Assembly uh, came up with a COVID response plan, agencies that had technical expertise were identified, WHO in the health sector, OCHA dealing with humanitarian issues, UNDP technical lead on socioeconomic programming. You know, so all of that happened relatively quickly. And, and part of the challenge, of course, was that nobody knew how bad this was. I mean, I was in a meeting here in the kingdom uh, hosted by King Salman uh, Relief Center on the 1st and 2nd of March with a number of, of heads of United Nations agencies present looking at the humanitarian uh, uh, crises globally. And even there, we were thinking, well, 
let's not panic, let's see how this moves along. You know, a lot of the data and analysis was happening in real time. So the reform uh, activities are, are doing the same thing. Um, I will say there are some interesting, you know, let's say, or threats or the big challenge within the UN is the multitude of different executive boards and committees that are responsible for different agencies. So it's not one agency, the United Nations, but it's many. Um, there are a number of innovations across the UN that are very promising. Uh, there's talk now in a new task force on looking at the very structure of United Nations agencies. Because one thing that we've all learned is that we seem to be able to work relatively well virtually. What does that mean for staffing, for where people physically sit? What costs could be saved? How could those costs be then brought to the field and brought to the beneficiaries? All of these kinds of things are actually being discussed at, at, this, uh, at this very moment. So yeah, you know, I think in the UN, we need to be optimistic because that's the nature of our business. Um, so uh, thank you, Fahad. Thank you, Adam. Um, I'm uh, turning to uh, Jada and Martin and Louise. Uh, I think um, many of you, Jada explicitly mentioned uh, the challenge in terms of short term versus, uh, versus long term. Um, so, the question is, how can we ensure that the multilateral institutions, while we're dealing with this financial um, or uh, pandemic, um, that ensure their long-term objectives are not disrupted by the need to address the challenges for this immediate uh, crisis? Jada, you, you highlighted a little bit uh, on this, so if you can uh, elaborate on it. Uh, then Martin, uh, in terms of, uh, in particular, uh, the three challenges uh, that uh, the IMF uh, or the three objectives of the IMF uh, sees in terms of capacity, in terms of social acceptance, and also uh, reform to the quota. Uh, Jada, we start with you. Go ahead. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so I think there are two important issues. One is uh, that whatever policies and decisions are made to respond to the short term, uh, problems will have implications also longer term. So it's going to be, it's very important that we take this into account. Um, and as was just mentioned, there's a lot of uncertainty. It's not clear exactly when we are talking about short term, medium term, and long term, given the, the severity depth of this uh, health epidemic is, is not yet clear. We don't know in three months time where we will be exactly in terms of dealing with the health um, uh, crisis. So I think um, it's very important to sequence the measures as much as possible. What we see in many of the emerging markets and developing economies, and honestly also in advanced economies, if this is a three-month uh, period and we can all reopen up and uh, go to some sort of stabilization, then it's fine. But if it's protracted, then even in advanced economies, I think there will be a lot of issues as to how much stimulus can be provided and, and to who. So how do you prioritize um, which sector, which uh, corporate uh, gets, that gets support? It's gonna be very important. This is already the case for many of the developing economies, precisely because they have limited fiscal space. So what we have been uh, really focusing on is the immediate health uh, emergency supporting countries, um, together with other IFIs, the MDBs, uh, really leveraging our efforts. And then the livelihoods, meaning the social safety nets, using digital as much as possible to target these um, safety nets to um, households as well as the informal uh, firms. But then also looking forward as to as some of these countries have very limited corporate sector and you want to make sure that that remains as uh, because that's the engine of growth what is going to drive growth going forward so really prioritizing exporting firms firms that used to pay taxes in the past and uh, really focusing targeting efforts so that um, this stimulus doesn't go to vested interests and 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 quote unquote zombie firms but firms that are really going to drive growth forward so that's more on the agenda in terms of immediate term um, uh, measures. Of course, there will be, we all know, there will be a lot of insolvency. We already see it, there will be more of them. So making sure that the legal and regulatory frameworks are there for effective and fast resolution 
out of court settlement systems and like. And finally, taking the opportunity, and this is where I think the, the global uh, coordination really is important, to, because these countries will need support. The debt relief it, it might for the end of the year, that's not going to be enough for many countries. So taking the opportunity to think, how do we invest long term in much more sustainable way and support these countries um, by uh, by providing support to them, but in you know with taking into account sustainable growth uh, going forward. So that's what we have been really focusing on right now, both in terms of how do we manage the you know the onslaught of debt problems going forward, uh, how do we have more transparency, sustainability, um, and promote investment in sustainable uh, ways. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Martin. Yeah, thank you for, for the question. And um, perhaps I, I speak mostly to, um, to what we do at the fund, because I, I agree with Jayla on much of what she said, what, what we need for the global economy. I think we're pretty much see eye to eye on that. And I mentioned myself the need for sustainable growth already going forward. How do we do this at the fund as, as, a, as a multilateral institution? So first of all, um, we have evolved quite a bit, as you know, over the years uh, from from a, a dollar uh, kind of uh, move away from the gold standard to various debt crises to uh, this new environment now after the crisis. And um, how will we evolve? Well, the 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 um, view of the fund as a primarily and a fiscal and central bank institution has evolved at the latest since, at the least since Christine Lagarde introduced uh, issues such as climate, uh, gender, and um, and inequality to to our agenda quite officially. And there was a lot of debate at the fund. You know, is is this really something we should get into? And um, uh, to what extent is this consistent with our mandate? And the membership has really kind of grappled with that for quite some time. I think it's now fairly well established. For example, that climate is an integral part of a macro-critical uh, kind of um, framework that needs to think about sustainability and, and how to minimize shocks and spillovers going forward. And that debate is happening in our executive board and we, we are evolving. We are looking, for example, at, um, at issues that have to do with the financial sector. We're looking at issues that have to do with taxation. We're also asking ourselves, does the fund really have um, kind of the, the mandate to make recommendations in the area of climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. To what extent can we speak as an institution to that? And um, this iterative process with our executive board is, is, is kind of um, showing us very quickly where there's a consensus and, and where the staff, where our management can also push toward a new consensus going forward. And um, uh, I think we're in a good place to uh, engage in this debate going forward with our membership. So that's going to be a key focus. Um, I think when we come to the um, annual meetings later in October, um, uh, barring uh, another outbreak of, of crisis and programs uh, of the scale that we had just passed through, I think much of the debate of the annual meetings will be about, so how do we, how do we um, build this economy going forward? How do we make it sustainable? And um, it goes also into other areas that, that are kind of um, slowly uh, getting on the horizon of our membership. For example, on the, on the fintech area, we've had the Bali principle some time ago um, that, that gave, some, gave some guidance to our countries. Now we can build on them and, and make suggestions and help them implement um, a shift toward a more digitized uh, economy. So we're kind of a living, breathing organism, if you want. Um, and the fact that... Um, we do strive for consensus, but um, that at the fund, we do have countries with different um, voting shares and, and ways to influence the discussion has in general helped because uh, we don't have the situation where, um, except for, for some key decisions, of course, where members can block with their, with their um, votes or several countries together can block with their votes. But we don't have a situation where one individual country can say, um, uh, stop the, the progress on a particular issue. There's always going to be a, a chance that, that the majority of, of the votes go uh, go in a certain direction. And um, we're, we're trying to facilitate that progress to make it as consensual as possible. But um, 
as an institution, I think we've always been very keen on, on, on adapting. We're having three tools, the lending I mentioned already, the surveillance I talked about. We also do a lot of um, uh, technical assistance in some of these new areas. We're building up capacity. And that's how we want to facilitate that transition and be the most helpful we can be to our membership. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Martin. Uh, Louis? Uh, thank, thanks, Fahad. I think that um, you raised an extremely important question, which is uh, uh, when the short term will become the long term. And um, I, I think they are, the, the issue is, is, is clear. Countries have been busy and policymakers now uh, dealing with the health emergency situation. So basically saving lives. And that is the, the, the most pressing uh, uh, challenge they've been having to face. And then they've been trying to do all that while supporting those who have been most adversely affected by the containment, the confinement measures that were needed uh, or have been needed up to now. Uh, we are at an interesting point where we can start transitioning from rescue mode towards the recovery. Uh, and we don't know uh, the timing of that. We don't know the specific characteristics that uh, our economies are, or to put it differently, uh, the, 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 how this crisis will affect economies uh, concretely uh, moving forward, economies and societies. Uh, but we know that there are uh, likely candidates, there are certain sectors of the economy that are likely to be changed uh, in a more durable manner. Retailing will be changed in a durable manner. Uh, hospitality and tourism, uh, they may be affected very differently from, they are likely to be affected very differently from manufacturing, for instance. Huh? So how can we make that transition? One point that we need to have in mind is that there are policy trade-offs uh, here involved in the choices that are being made now and that will have to be dealt with. Uh, a concrete example, countries have differed a lot in terms of how they protect. Uh, some countries have put in place uh, uh, very comprehensive uh, mechanisms of job retention, so attaching workers to the jobs that they have. Other countries haven't done that. Uh, those different choices will affect the ability of economies to restructure uh, uh, in the recovery phase and beyond. Uh, it's very likely that labor markets will react differently to those institutional uh, uh, choices that have been made. The same goes for firms. Support for firms will have uh, different mechanisms, will have uh, implications for the longer term. What is essential is that in whatever choices that uh, policymakers make, that they have in mind that over time, economies will need to be to restructure. And restructuring implies that labor will need to be reallocated to sectors where economic prospects are most promising. So uh, I think it's very difficult to come back to, uh, to, to your initial point, uh, to uh, think uh, right now, given the uncertainties, uh, to think about what is most promising, what is the best course of action uh, now, without having in mind the trade-offs and the possible unintended consequences that, of the policy choices that are, that are made today. Uh, and all that on top of underlying pressures that economies have been facing for many years. When we talk about population changing, uh, uh, population aging, when we talk about this gradual fall in productivity growth that most economies have been facing uh, for decades now, you know, that adds to the challenge. So uh, if restructuring post-COVID is done in a way that is not supportive uh, of uh, renewed productivity growth uh, over time, then the potential growth of our economies will suffer. Uh, so we are talking now about the choices that will have very long term implications uh, and that will need to be thought out given what we know right now, given the, uh, the experience that we've been accumulating, hence the importance, and I stress that, that the international community uh, um, that, you know, make joint efforts to learn and to make sure that that experience uh, is, is, is shared and that we can learn from each other uh, so that we can come out of it uh, with, uh, with, with a stronger performance than we had uh, before we entered the crisis. Uh, thank you, Luis, very insightful. Um, and, uh, and for now, we have a few questions from the audience, but unfortunately, uh, uh, time is running out on us. Uh, let me conclude by asking our audience to join me in thanking all uh, the panelists for a very insightful uh, uh, answers and as well as um, uh, opening remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, um, with the closing of this panel, 
we also conclude this three-day um, T20 mid-year conference. It has been an exciting journey to arrange and switch from an in-person conference to a fully virtual conference. Uh, it has its challenges, mostly technical, uh, but it has also many advantages. Uh, we don't need to uh, travel. Uh, it doesn't take uh, us from our uh, office uh, hours much time as in a person conference. So this is a new experience for the, our T20 summit, which is going to be at the end of uh, October, 31st of October, 1st of um, November. Uh, it most likely will be a hybrid uh, summit. So um, we will have um, a physical meetings uh, as while also observing uh, social distancing measures and precautionary measures. Uh, but also we will make it available uh, virtually uh, for our international community. As I mentioned in, our, in, in the opening uh, sessions on the first day, we have, we're proud to have more than 700 authors contributing to 150 policy briefs. Uh, those authors coming from uh, more than 70 countries. So the T20 does not only represent uh, uh, the G20 countries, but also non-G20 countries. And in particular, many coming from this region, Middle East and North Africa. Um, also, we're proud to have um, among um, our, our membership more than 500 think tank and, and research uh, institutions. This shows the, the commitment of the think tank community and the T20 community to the mandate of providing policy recommendations to the regions of the T20. Uh, I know there have been a very interesting and useful presentations over the last few, uh, few days. Uh, I attended uh, many of them, and I think they will also enhance our recommendations to the T20 at the end of the process. And as we draft our final uh, policy briefs before the end of July, which is the deadline for the second and final draft. Uh, between now and the T20 uh, summit uh, at the end of October, we will focus our effort in opening the dialogue and discussing uh, our policy recommendations or your policy recommendations with the working group, uh, with members of the working group, uh, and also issuing an official statement. We will keep you updated on all our activities um, in our uh, social media platform, uh, Twitter and, and, and LinkedIn and other platform, and also uh, our weekly newsletter, which from now until the summit will be converted into a bi-weekly uh, letter. Finally, I would like to thank our T20 team uh, from both uh, KF Press uh, and uh, Capsar, as well as our lead co-chairs and co-chairs of the task forces for organizing this event, event and ensuring it went smoothly, especially the team that is working uh, in the background to make this as smooth as possible. Uh, we have a very productive three days. Uh, so I thank you once again and for your participation and wish we all emerge from this crisis stronger and with a more prosperous, inclusive and sustainable future for all of us. Thank you very much and we'll see you soon. Ma'asalama. Ma'asalama, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.